go ahead and get started. So good evening, everyone. My name is Aisha Williams, and I am Deputy Director at the Laundromat Project. For those of you who are new to our community, the LP is a Black-rooted, POC-centered arts organization working at the Center of Arts, Social Justice, and Community Building. Since 2005, we have advanced artists and neighbors as change agents in their own communities. Thank you for joining us this evening for part one of our two-day public program, Radical Mapping, Making Meaning in Our Communities. This program is supported in part by Humanities New York. This evening, we are presenting Radical Mapping, part one, Fireside Chat with Julie Moretu and Kemi Alesami. On the screen is a blue and green event flyer with the program title, today's date and time, and a listing of our panelists. The featured image is a detail of a colorful abstract painting by Julie Moretu with many intersecting lines and marks titled Bredopistics, a Renegade Excavation. We'd like to begin the program by sharing a few access notes. The Laundromat Project is committed to hosting accessible and inclusive events. Real-time captioning, CART transcription is available for this program. You can turn captions on or off through the closed captions tab located on the features bar at the bottom of this screen. We'll be recording today's session for archival purposes. The recording will also be available on YouTube after the event. We also encourage you to share any questions you might have using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen and we'll reserve the chat for chatter. Can't see each other, but we wanna know that you're all there. So please feel free to hop into the chat, make some noise, share thoughts and all of the above. We also begin each public program with a land acknowledgement. We at the Laundromat Project respectfully acknowledge that our primary location of operations at 1476 Fulton Street in Brooklyn, New York, sits on the unoccupied and unceded lands of the Canarsie, who are part of the Muncie Lenape. We recognize them as the original stewards of this land and pay respects to their elders, past, present, and future. I invite you to join me in acknowledging the histories of the land you are currently gathered and pay respect and gratitude to its original stewards. And now for the program. Throughout history, maps have helped shape human endeavor and experience. Hardly neutral and deeply embedded in the fault, faultiness of power, maps have, have been used to name and delineate lands, peoples, and states. Yet for just as long, artists, activists, communities, and those cartographically marginalized, especially people of color, have drawn themselves, their histories, their dreams, and their realities onto new self-determined maps. Over the next two days, we will explore how Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities can creatively use practices like cultural asset mapping, cartography, and archiving to invest in and make meaning in our neighborhoods. We gathered a global group of artists, historians, map makers, local leaders, community members, and you to share how mapping concepts and methods can democratize the knowing, keeping, and making of people in place. For today's program, I'm thrilled to share that we are joined by the LP's Executive Director, Kemi Alesini, and celebrated artist, Julie Moretu, for a conversation. You can access everyone's bio via the link in the chat. And now I'm excited to turn it over to Kemi. Welcome, Kemi. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction. So incredibly excited to have everyone in the Zoomiverse who is joining us. And thank you, Julie, for joining in this conversation. I can't wait. I've been excited for a while. Um, again, I am Kemi Alesami. I use the pronoun she, her. I am executive director of the Laundromat Project. I am beaming in from Flatbush, Brooklyn, which is Lenape land. I am a black woman wearing uh, white rimmed glasses, uh, medium length uh, dreadlocks and seated in front of a bookshelf with a bit of art and some of my favorite books, art books in particular. And I'm wearing a dress that reminded me a little bit of a Julie Moretu painting, even though it comes from the other side. Um, it's an Adira uh, from Nigeria print, but multicolored with spirals and, and swirls and things of that nature. So um, again, incredibly happy to have Julie here and each of you. 
Um, as you may know, uh, Julie has a beautiful and head spinning, stupendous retrospective currently on view at the Whitney Museum and has been curated beautifully by Christine Kim and Rujeko Hockley. If you haven't seen it yet, please do yourself a favor and you should go and see it. You have in New York until, until August the 8th, or uh, you can check it out in Atlanta or Minneapolis in the coming months. On screen, you are looking at uh, installation shot from the Whitney Museum of a painting that was made specifically for this space. It is named Ghost uh, Rhythm and uh, After the Raft. And it is a large uh, multicolored uh, painting, uh, reds and blue and greens and whites and blacks, uh, gestural marks of various sorts. It is facing a large, large window that overlooks the city of New York and the Hudson River and in the distance, New Jersey. And there's some count viewing couches in between. So here is how the artist Glenn Ligon describes Julie's work and place in our time. Julie is the painter I turn to when I want to think about how to trouble the line between abstraction and figuration, between local and global concerns, between painterly restraint and joyous abandon. She's a history painter and an Afrofuturist at the same time. Well, that is high praise from a very high place, Glenn and points to the ways that Julie has mapped new paths in painting and in our understanding of cities, time, politics, and power. To offer a little bit of uh, personal history, Julie and I met over 20 years ago at the project, Christian Hayes' influential Harlem Gallery that operated in the late 90s and into the Audis. She was a new artist and I was a new curator and we were both just beginning um, our journeys. Um, and here we are 20 years later. Um, and like so many, I was immediately intrigued and impressed by her work, her mind and her spirit. Not long afterwards, the Walker Art Center where I was then a curator invited Julie to be an artist in residence in the Twin Cities, so St. Paul and Minneapolis. And this led to two uh, incredible things, I think. Uh, one was her residency project, Minneapolis and St. Paul are East African cities, which invited new immigrants from the Horn of Africa, mostly high school students who had only been in this country for three to five years, sometimes even less than that, to document their own lives through photographs and sound recordings. Um, and these materials were then used to create a beautiful interactive website and all of these photographs and sound recordings that were generated in the program later on became part of the permanent collection of the Minnesota Historical Society, one of the things that I'm most proud of. Um, you can go to the Minnesota Historical Society now and look at that material that Julie helped to create and put in the world through working with these students. So the first photograph you're looking at, and just to give you a little taste of this project, um, is a poster that, that came out of the project. At the top, it's multicolored with bars. And the, at the top is a map of the state of Minnesota with a red star indicating where Minneapolis and St. Paul are. are. Um, there, is, there are five layers of text in different languages, including Amharic and English and other languages. And it says Minneapolis and St. Paul are East African cities. Next slide, please. Thank you, Amelia. This is a, a picture of a photograph of Julie, um, who you can see on the far right. And she is gesturing um, in, uh, to a number of young women students at the time at Edison High School. And there's lots of things on the walls and they are paying attention and, and engaged. Um, so this is you know, baby Julie from 2002. Um, and then the last slide for this project is just one still image from the uh, 
website that was created by Entropy 8 and Aurea Harvey. Um, and it states a picture of the different flags that represent the different students that attend Edison High School. And this is one of the photographs which you can see taken by the student who you can also, uh, uh, the photograph of the flags on the right, photograph on the left is the student uh, Marion and who stated this. And you can see that this is all embedded in a website that actually looked a little bit like a Julie Moretzu painting as you kind of move through it. And um, so this was done with great care to kind of be reminiscent of Julie's work. So just to give you a little bit of a taste and the next uh, slide, please, or the, um, yes. So the other thing that came out of this residency was that it was capped with an exhibition called Drawing Into Painting. This was Julie's first museum solo show. It was curated by Douglas Fogel and myself in 2003. At that time, Douglas wrote, Meritu charts a visual course that not only speaks to the tragic aspect of history, but also to the moments of liberation and freedom. That statement still holds true today. And the photograph that you're looking at now is from that show. Um, it is a painting uh, which opens the Whitney show um, called uh, Transcending the New International. It is black and white. Um, it is large scale and it almost looks like it has two wings and various black gestures kind of emanating from a centrifugal force. Um, and in front of it is a, is a wooden bench for contemplation. So if you fast forward now to this evening, Julie continues to map and explore across canvases, institutions, and geographies. Tonight, we'll get to touch on her painting practice and other ways that she is mapping new worlds for us to discover. So again, welcome, Julie. So great to have you here tonight. Yay. So, um, Thank you, Kemi. It's such an honor to be here. And um, it's, uh, and I love the idea of the conversation and, the, and this project that you're doing around radical mapping. And it's kind of amazing that it's happening at the same time as this show and mm -hmm. the, the, our history together. Um, I will never forget the time when you called right after my opening at the project and invited me to the Walker for that residency project and that exhibition. And it was a uh, important marker in my life. So it's a super honor to be here. Our first catalog and all that work we did was really memorable. So thank you for the invitation. Oh, wow. Thank you. And nice to go down memory lane a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I found a quote by you that I really loved and really fits with our theme today. Um, I, it's you speaking, I am constantly mining the counter narrative, the counter realities and the counter possibilities. So this idea of the counter is very much tied to um, the ideas that we're trying to explore in radical mapping this program. What does radical mapping mean to you? What's this idea of moving in the counter space, the against? Um, well, I think answering the question of what radical mapping means is, is complicated because mapping itself is a complicated pro project and what it and and it's how do you i mean in in many ways the kind of use of maps has shifted over time and it has it has operated for systems of power in very particular ways it is uh, it is uh, un, um, operated for systems of extraction colonialism um and other forms of kind of trying to um deal with uh orientations around space that are about um, delineating and claiming space and, and marking space in those kinds of ways. And so I, I think that the language around map making and surveying is, is also a form of knowledge building too. And, there, and, and it's a form of, at, while at the same time that it was this, what, this one form of knowledge building that comes from this um, uh, colonial background, and, 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 and navigation background, the, the, the sense of trying to, the idea of trying to make sense of space through the abstract ideas of mapping have been a long time a part of all forms of culture and have been a way of, try, of, one, of, of trying to make sense of our world and trying to make sense of our space. And this is part of like homo sapiens like for, for, for the, from the beginning of time. And, you know, I've been really 
interested in map making since my drawing started to look like maps. I mean, it kind of came out of the what happened naturally in the drawings or intuitively in the drawings. But I think that, um, so from that time, I started to build a map archive and early read maps to understand um, the currents in the Polynesian islands uh, to, uh, and, 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 and Southeast Asia all the way through to making sense of like greater, um, the greater orient points of orientation through the Pacific Ocean, through star maps, which actually are maps, are, are markers in a particular way that shift over time and through space, but were our first navigation devices. And so all maps of land came from the idea of this, of the, of the celestial as, a, as somewhat of a guiding uh, marker for us, but that's this constantly evolving and moving reality. And, and, and to me, um, you know, I guess I, I guess those were were really important ways to think around making sense of space, but and making sense of information. But to really understand the machinations of those systems helps in like finding places where there are gaps in those systems and the breaks and, and what works in that language and what doesn't. So that Borges story where the map is actually the scale, uh, a real scale, a real life scale. So what, how, how useful is that map? And, and that, that those types of questions that come up are the other side of pushing the, the absurdity of the effort of mapping to, to, its, to its maximum. And not to say there isn't really massive use value in the this, in this scientific knowledge of space and, and that effort. But that that's that that there's also somewhat of a futile effort in that because it's space is constantly evolving, changing, and shifting, and um, culture and people don't don't engage in land in the way that we understand maps to be. So for me, all of that was very very interesting, um, especially again coming from the African perspective, where you know again being a, a person who emerged in the post-colonial moment and came into the world and came of age in the post-colonial moment really understanding um, how complicated and, and, and counterproductive and harmful and violent maps actually were for most people and most cultures. And in, my, in, in, the, in the country of Ethiopia, for example, you're seeing the, the kind of daily outplay of that form of violence by the kind of um, delineation of ethnic groups by, by geography. And, and um, what can happen when systems of power affect, try to build up and balkanize culture based on those kinds of things. So it's a really, really complicated space, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And, for, and it's always been this really interesting space for me to um, just thinking about um, culture, space, myself, and who I am, which is what basically I think I try to do in, in making. Yeah, no, absolutely. That was really rich in so many different threads. Um, I want to place us in a, in a map on a place in which is the project I was just sharing about uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, our East African cities, just to talk about that for a moment. Um, that was a project that was incredibly um, uh, on the earlier side of my career as well, and really has influenced what I do. And really uh, one of the projects, I worked on a number of really um, fantastic residencies. We had a great program at the Walker at the time that really led directly to the work I do now with the laundromat project. There's literally a one-to-one -one relationship uh, between your project and what I get to call my career now, right? So I'm curious, um, and, it, and just speaking to what you said about maps and geopolitics and the people um, that you noticed that first visit you made to Minneapolis and said, these are my people. I recognize these folks at the TSA um, and, and you know, at the airport. Um, and, and that when we invited you to become artist in residence, you were really clear right away who you wanted to work with. And they were very new to the city and they were there because of issues related to maps, right? And like how maps had been done to them. And now they were here and being invited by you to create a new map, their own maps of the city they were in. I'm really um, curious about 20 years later, what of that project still stays with you or resonates with you or shows up in the way that you kind of think and move through um, uh, your work, uh, uh, think about Minneapolis, just like what's still, what stuck? Well, I, I think um, what was what was interesting is when we did that project, that was like right on the edge of technological capabilities. It was pre iPhone and pre cameras in phones in the way that we have them now. So we instead of being able to give people 
phones, we gave kids, all, the, the, all these students, uh, film cameras, like disposable film cameras. So that's something that just stuck, like when, when, in thinking about that. Um, one way that that project still resonates, and I, th I bring that up because we're in at Denison Hill, uh, artist um, collective and nonprofit organization, um, artist residency project that we have up in the Catskills, me, uh, Paul Pfeiffer and Lawrence Chua among others. Uh, we, we, uh, one of the projects we're really focused on right now and in developing is called the Exodus Media Pro Workshop. And this is, um, and, it, and in many ways, there's a, there's, it, it, it is a much more complex and um, sophisticated, more sophisticated project in a particular way because of what we can do with technology and because of uh, film editing, what, how, how much that technology has evolved, but also I think I, liberatory ideas around pedagogy and thinking around what, how to approach this. And so I think there's many, there's, it, at that time there was a few of like the way, I was a younger artist, but it was also, we were a fewer group of people trying to figure out this idea. And this is something that uh, Paul Pfeiffer really has been thinking about working within his own work and brought to the Deniston Hill pro uh, mm -hmm. conversation and a project that we're really trying to evolve and develop as part of the Deniston Hill curriculum. And, and, and in that, there's this aspect of really trying to, uh, at, how do you make, and, it, and this goes back to that project, how, do you, how does one make sense of their own reality and, the, and their own self? How do you make sense of yourself and the world around you and, that, and, and art's place in negotiating that? A lot of um, these students, it was, it was clear with um, us, is that most of their parents weren't that excited about an art project, or they were excited about them doing an art project, but they weren't encouraging of those of most of those students to think about arts as a, as something that they could really do. They were really encouraged to go into science and medicine and things things that seemed a lot more lucrative and productive in their life. And productive, I think, is more the word than lucrative, but. Um, but and, 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 and would contribute to development and contribute to problems in the world. And, and, and it was really interesting to get to talk to them about how art plays that role as well. And the role of art in making sense and in envisioning futures, in making sense of oneself and, and find and make and being able to like work through co cognitive confusion, work through dis displacement, how to really reorient and, and, and find one's, one's place and how to claim place. Mm -hmm. um, and these, and a lot of these, um, I think some of those, there's a lot of strings to those projects that are, 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 are part of the bare bones of this Exodus Media Workshop in a particular way um, in terms of just, as one source, as, as one way of thinking around it. So for me, that's, that's something that it, even thinking about it now that I was attracted to doing that as a residency project um, was interesting. But also I'm a painter and, a, and, and painting is a very solitary, um, I mean, I work with other people, but in the ge generally, you, you're by yourself working, thinking through things, and it's this very self-expressive kind of um, space of trying to again make sense of oneself, but in the process of like this, this, this in a process, in a studio process, where through drawing and painting and at the actual making and creative work, different things start to happen, and that's an isolated, really internal experience for the most part even though I think of intuition as a space of collective congregation in a way and in, in, as a collective sense of the past and ancestors and, you know, but it, overall it becomes this very solo project. Mm -hmm. And well, when I was invited to do the artist residency, I was interested not in trying to bring my work to anyone, but I was more interested in how to empower these new immigrants to the, to the area, which I remember that, that experience from, I was much younger than they were. I was in second grade as opposed to seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade. Um, but they, but, but that, the, but that experience of building new realities, making new friendships, of understanding culture from very different places in ways that your parents don't understand, that whole ne negotiation was something that I wanted to try and provide certain tools that I use in my work to these, to these, um, to the, to those um, young um, artists and those young students. Um, yeah, yeah. Now that was really powerful, and there was one, um, all of that. Thank you for sharing, and uh, nice to kind of hear how that kind of continues to resonate. Right? We don't know how things might show up later in our lives. 
Um, and I remember one particular day when we had uh, the students uh, visit and one of the young women said, uh, we were in a conference room at the Walk Art Center. We normally went to visit them at the school, which was on purpose kind of being on their turf, but we had invited them. And one of the young women um, said, are we in the museum? Is this the museum? Is this a museum? It was just something new for her. Mm -hmm. And we immediately, uh, your behest, got up and took them downstairs and, and gave them a, a tour of the ultra Baroque show. Um, so it was yeah. this kind of introduction to this is a thing in a, a particular part of the world. Um, art was, you know, part of the world in this way, in this visual way, um, or more institutionalized way, because obviously um, there is uh, incredible art in East Africa and among them culturally as well. Um, I'm going to take things a little, I want to, I'm kind of thinking about issues of space and geography. And uh, just to touch on that one point, please. just a little, we what was so interesting is through the project and through their work and incorporating their families, their parental stories, their ancestral stories, yes. their net, their migration stories, their um, activities in the city and an expression of their daily lives. Their families became completely yes. involved in the project yes. and were excited and came to the museum, not just for the exhibition of my exhibition, but they all participated in the viewing of their work in the, yes. in, the, in, the, in, the in the Walker Education Center. So that was really cool too, that to, to bring that community into the into the art center of Minneapolis and um, and and to really, for me, that was a movie moment as well. So I, I really appreciated how it became this two-way. Um, where we learned a lot from working with them, but yeah. it became this, this effort to study the city and this culture together. And what's so cool about that community too, is that it was a big Oromo community, yeah. a big Tigray and Ethiopian community, Eritrean yeah. community. And, 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 and these are, and it was so interesting to all work together in Somali community and, mm -hmm. and, and how differently everyone approached this, but how respectful everyone was of each other's culture and work and, um, be and, and that similar kind of background at, as at, and what was potent about creating like they were really engaged in having their work as part of the website having their work as part of this historic institution in Minneapolis and that they were a part of this bigger project that was in this institution that they were that their city was proud of 100 um, percent now um, sticking with Minneapolis for a moment this is a heavy week, right? Like yet yeah. another um, black man, uh, black person killed um, at the hands of the police and in Minnesota, um, in you know, near the greater Minneapolis Twin Cities area, Dante Wright. Um, and in thinking about your work and, uh, you know, again, visiting the show at the Whitney and there are the pieces um, uh, kind of building off of Ferguson. There are pieces, uh, paintings, referencing Charlottesville, kind of being haunted, right? Uh, they are kind of layered in there. Um, so we're not immediately able to see, but there that material is sitting in those paintings. And for me, that's really about kind of, you've, you've done a lot of, throughout your career and your practice, the emotional and the racially charged and the politically charged, and this kind of telling um, uh, specifically about the American racial project, the failed project, um, mm. is so uh, embedded in your work. And I wanted to really hear how you think about the, our emotional map or your emotional map and how you kind of process, um, uh, how does emotion kind of fit into the making of your work with this material um, at its base? So interesting. I mean, what it brings up for me is the is 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 uh, the show that's at the New Museum right now, um, Mourning mm -hmm. and Grief in America. And um, I think that that that, uh, that that show, I think what it offers is the n numerous ways that 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 is processed and digested and 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 um, metabolized in in uh, efforts of creating and creation. Um, I think that. Uh, that one can't live in this context without that being, you know, without without having to negotiate the reality of that. And to be honest, I don't even think that you need to be an artist of color or a black artist. I mean, 
um, goes back to the ideas of Baldwin when he talks about freedom and that no one is free until every like until everyone is free. And you know the letter he wrote his nephew when he basically towards the end wishes him God Godspeed, but he was basically like that's the fundamental issue is that they have to this this is this is the only way it will change is is through that fundamental desire for liberation for everybody, including. You know, and so that 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 predicament and the tension of constantly living within that madness and violence and and negotiating that um, is part of like and the effort of, of like uh, you know uh, thinking around invention and creativity as a possibility for something else, and not just an insistence on being, but. On, the, on being able to invent and, and, and mine another possibility. That can be thought of as many, many ways. But um, somebody said recently in the, this conversation I was listening to, I'm trying to find the, the, the quote right now, but she, um, she, she mentioned in this conversation I was listening to, she was um, on the podcast, uh, the Paul Holdengraber podcast with mm -hmm. uh, th that uh, uh, a couple days ago. Um, one second. Let me just. Yes, please. The, her name is yeah Natalie Atoke. Is that how you pronounce her name? Atoke, I think. And she was um, she was on this uh, in this conversation, and she's talked about joy as a as a dissident state of mind in constant revolve against madness and death. And mm -hmm. what I loved so much about that quote is what and, and what she was saying was thinking about joy as a place of resistance, like as a form of invention, not a, a, not a desire for a state of happiness or a constant state of happiness, but that to find joy as a way to negotiate madness and death and then to negotiate violence, that, that there is, there is, that that's part of that insistence on creativity, insistence on being, mm. insistence on mm. invention mm. and insistence on song, insistence on humor, whatever, it, whatever are coping mechanisms, but also mechanisms of invention and possibility. And um, so I think that's been fundamental to most, to most any human who has to suffer through any of this kind of systems of uh, violence and oppression, but especially in a racialized situation where, um, you know, and, and racialized and, cl and classes situation of, of really, you know, of horror and and violence and and within the daily experience of that uncertainty of that kind of reality of the reality that your children or your your siblings or your your um nephews could be shot by you know that 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 what happened yesterday could be any of our relatives the daily experience of that is is a constant is a constant reality and yet we all keep driving and keep doing we live and and you see the react and there and we and there and we live with a lot of joy as well as a lot of constant uh mourning and 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 the, it's the it's the that place between those two hmm. um and the breaks in that that are part of that you know that tenor of making from yeah but but we're way more complex than just that suffering yeah. person and that and 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 that's a really important issue and i think one of the beautiful deliberate um, intentions of the show, Okui Show at the New Museum right now, which I recommend everyone to see if you get a chance. I absolutely uh, agree that it is definitely- it, It's um, called right Grief now, and Grievance, I think. In, in, yes, yeah. Grief and Grievance at the New Museum. I don't remember when it closes, but I'm sure someone can tell us um, in the chat. I think people have a little bit of time, but thank you for that. And. And Alice Walker has also uh, talked a lot about the space of joy and joy as a, as a space of resistance, right? So it is living in that space and trying to hold on to both of those realities of that deep sorrow um, that is our state uh, oftentimes as, as black people and people of color in this uh, American context. And um, what would joy look like without black folks? Like the way that that depth of being able to to uh, to just claim and attack joy is also a really big part of um, our story in this place. Um, one of the things I uh, wanted to hear a little bit about. So you. Um, really, one of the things I was struck in going to the Whitney show was sheer 
scale, right? I want to talk a little bit about kind of the making, right? So the sheer scale of the work that they do mark time and place, they have a cinematic quality, they're enveloping, they're overwhelming, they're impossible to ignore, right? And then there's all this tactility in that you're using so many different uh, you know, from sumi ink to acrylic, you're using spray guns and, you know, hydraulic lifts and all this stuff to kind of make. So I want to hear a little bit about um, this claim, how you construct your aesthetics also through space and through tactility in your work. Interesting. Um, that's, I mean, it's a great question. And I think, uh, it has all evolved. It's, I think it was a very long time additive process where it all began with the tiniest rapidiograph pen and or a etching needle on a on a on a copper on a copper plate. And and little by little that evolved to tracing a ruler and then painting a line and then masking a line and then, you know, and the acrylic paint and then being able to really push that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't um, I was saying earlier today, I don't, I don't have the patience or um, capability. I don't even know who that person was that could sit there and draw like that for those hours <laughs> anymore. But um, that's one of the joys of, or one of the, in, and one of the like pleasures of like going back through this work and being able mm -hmm. to see all this work together because that was a different person. I mean, 25 years ago that could do that or 20 years ago, 10 years ago. And, and the work has evolved so much, but I think, usually the new work like new intentions in the work mm -hmm. some of that they're just felt and desired and they come through as in a, 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 a much more experimental way other times um they're they're at the earlier days i think i, I really tried to build everything for around the idea of what what did this to contribute like could i create a, a way of painting that really related to the rapidograph pen and related to the idea around map making that i could actually draw in painting not just use painting as a place for for a form of uh, expressive work or a form of working without with with paint and um, how could i like uh, investigate what I was trying to do within the drawing. It wasn't even the interest to draw in painting. It was how could I make paintings where you could layer nine things at once? Because with Mylar, you couldn't do that. You could only mm -hmm. build so many generations and have so much of a tectonic that you could actually look through. So paint became the technique of how to build that became a technique I tried to build to answer that question, to actually serve that purpose in the work. How then could I build layers of different kinds of maps and space? Well then projecting wireframe drawings created a link to socialized space in a very, very different way and to political intention and mm -hmm. to myth and mm -hmm. to memory. All of this came through by, not, by, by being able to use these different forms of um, information, technology um, and language and then to, when, and as those became layered and more complex and I was able to play with those in a different way, then, then something else could emerge from within that. And when the language really started to evolve in the Mogama paintings and really mm -hmm. lift off the aperture or the, uh, the, uh, the, the infrastructure of the architecture and that, and that place, that's when I started to really let the architectural language go and move into these paintings that the brush and the mark and what could evolve in that space what and 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 within that gray space like what could exist there that is what became more interesting or more important and then it just continued to evolve to, into the blurred photographs so i think like each of those techniques whether it was the spray technique and i wanted to get a more opaque really heavy felt spray that was then i was able to do that with screen printing a sprayed, a, a sprayed feeling rather than actually just spraying it because I couldn't get it as thick as I wanted it with uh, the aerosol. So it's just all of these ways of thinking around image making and making and playing with visual language and trying to do something that conceptually also related to what I was thinking about in the marks. So the digitized spray is also operate similarly to the way the marks operate in a very different way, in a very different way and participating in this construction in a very different way. But they're all related to one another and they emerge out of each other in a way. Absolutely, that's um, fantastic to hear. So one of the things that was really interesting that I didn't kind of think about and realize until I was at the Whitney show, which opens with the transcending the new international and then again closes with ghost rhythm 
is that both of those paintings, again, 20 or so years apart, one at the Walker, made in relationship to the window at the Walker in that gallery, uh, Gallery 8 is what it was called at the time, and then at the Whitney in relationship to the window looking out over the city and, and dealing with issues of immigration. And by the way, the transcending uh, uh, piece, for those who don't know, really is dealing with the um, post-colonial utopian and dystopian moment of, of Africa kind of coming out of uh, colonization in the, in the 60s and early 70s. Um, so kind of, you know, uh, two, two paintings that were created knowing, with you knowing where they would be and how they would be placed uh, specifically. Um, so I wanted to hear a little bit about kind of making these paintings with the actual space in mind, a uh, specific place, time, and, and, and I don't know how often this has happened, but these two paintings, it did. So I wanted to kind of hear a little bit about whether that was just by chance. It's so interesting you brought that up because I didn't even think about that when I, until you mentioned it, that that's the first painting you see, which was the, which was the first painting of that scale that mm -hmm. I made. Um, and it was really made as a panoramic painting to oppose that wall looking into Minneapolis. And it was also this painting that it took time to get to what that would be, but um, it was after 9-11. The other two paintings were very informed by that post 9-11 moment, but this was really a, like trying to negotiate the idea of the failures of this utopian, um, the post-colonial utopian desire on the continent, but and and the kind of entropic post, uh, dystopian reality that that we that evolved in in the continent in terms of all different for all different dynamics, yeah. and and yet there was this constant gener generative aspect. But but what was interesting is that that was also taking place in a daily reality in the United States at that time, which was, it was almost consuming itself and its, and its, and its previous global, gl the previous kind of internationalist global per optimistic perspective that was very much the pre 9-11 um, Clinton era informed era of like um, American kind of progress, American, the, the idea of the American engagement internationally, globalization and the possibilities of that and what the, in, what technology and the web and, and it could offer all of that. And we see, we live in a very, very different moment now. And that felt very naive, but right after 9-11, that sh world shifted. Everyone, it was a visceral sh a palpable shift. And, and that painting was, was made in, during the moment of the Gulf War. It was made during the moment of this kind of very repressive, reactionary, internal changing United States but I was thinking about the continent of Africa. So to me, that's an interesting, different looking, uh, looking back at that moment of, of thinking around that wall. Um, but again, both, both of them are dealing, it's, it's weird to bring it up because they both were dealing with this idea of displacement, this idea of migration, the, the complications around that and the contradictions inherent in, in, in our world thinking around that, around the kind of human, um, human needs and, um, the human rights, dignity, and realities of most people, most people, uh, most agents on, in the world, and how how do we negotiate that? And why does this border? Why does this create um, give give certain people certain access to resources and others not? And and it literally means life or death. And and this then this river being a, a description of that. But it was it's interesting that those paintings have that relationship. And I, I'm grateful for you to bringing it up because I hadn't even thought of it until you mentioned it. Um, but I, I, I mean, it's it's a it's an interesting way to think around space echoes, and echoes things. Don't yeah, in our lives. Right? Yeah, yeah, echoing and the and the relate and the desire to create something that does relate and respond to a space. The the that. And a lot of the a lot of times I do that with painting, but it's and the paintings move around. But it's it's interesting to have those two come together here. Fabulous. So thank you uh, for that. Um, I just was you know read the label and went wait a minute. There's you know there's a moment. Yeah. Um, so I want to open it up to uh, uh, Q and A, and we have a few. And encourage everyone if you have questions to use the Q and A uh, box to share those. Um, so. Colleen Cooks 
um, writes, how did you become interested in maps as a child or young adult? And what types of maps did you grow up on? Um, and also, do you think that Gen Z, having grown up on Google Maps, might have a different spatial imaginary compared to um, any generation before? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and I think, but I think that that really happens um, with every generation as mm -hmm. technology has evolved and shifted. And, um, but yes, I mean, without a doubt, they, the, there's no, like I, when I was making this early work that's in the exhibition, I was talking about this earlier with some other, with some other friends, there was no internet as we know it. I mean, it was the beginning of email when I was making these early maps. There was no sense of, uh, of the, the, the spatial ideas that we, that we even think around through like um, through what the internet has offered the world is is such a different spatial imaginary that was even that was even possible early like when I was in school. In addition to that, the, yeah, my 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 children negotiate the world through Google Maps. Like to this day, my older son he counts on his map to get him around. He he recognizes his neighbor, but it's really this. And maybe, you know, there's an advantage to those who were spatially challenged and could never find their orientation like me early on to have these resources. But I, it's really interesting. My father's a geographer and there were maps in our life. There was a globe, there were, but I don't think it was that much more than most people. I think what really came up more in my life was a conversation around, uh, uh, around development, around how land and, 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 government and, and people in, 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 are, are, are the creators of these kind of structures, including the maps. I mean, not geological terrain, but, but um, political geography and, and, and political terrain and economic terrain and what happens in that and what is possible. So I think being raised with a geographer was formative in, 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 my, in my engagement with the world, but I think even more so his Africanist um, agenda and his and 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 my parents together that that reality i grew up with you know them fighting over the maps when we were driving in cars like we didn't have anything that told you which way to go you get lost they were, ah, i told you to turn here you did like that one or you know like i'm saying that in a playful way not like wait a minute yeah. Yeah. you pass the folded map around somebody spills something on it there was no you know there was it was a very very different sense a spatial a spatial sense and um and, and of course, yes, it will inform the, the imaginary a great deal. No, I imagine quite so. Um, we have one anonymous uh, question here. Um, ah, time being an abstraction revolving around, via art, what different space and place? I'm not sure about that, but the second question uh, in the same question is, what narratives perhaps as possible future imaginations are we protecting or projecting in the here and now? I'm actually gonna link this to a question that I um, uh, had and was kind of thinking about. Um, there are two related here. So, you, Julie, imagine mm -hmm. you are digging through uh, uh, the archive of a long lost and forgotten library or archive. What map or image would you most love to find? And what do you feel you are leaving as inheritance with what you are creating? And it doesn't, it can be paintings, it can be other things for folks who a hundred years from now are gonna be looking through an archive. Hmm. So it, it, I was, I've been thinking about the archive a lot recently and um, the difference between like orally and or, 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 or you know, orally communicated narratives and, and history and knowledge forms and that transmission of knowledge through, through, through being told stories and how that changes mm -hmm. and, and evolves over time. And then this kind of tradition of, of actually keeping um, this kind of, you know, um, organization of libraries and archives and, and, this, and this Cartesian, you know, very kind of rational way of kind of the European tradition of, of, of trying to maintain a literate, like, and most literate, most cultures that use language, how we use that as a form of like, 
trying to understand and 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 may and hold knowledge. And I I wonder how you know I wonder what rises to the top. I don't know. I I don't know what would be my most favorite thing to find. I think I'm still on the mission to go around and see as much as I can that has already been found. And there's there's an enormous amount of work in the world that I want to see. And sadly, a lot of that is in places that I, you know, Syria being one of them that I really want to be able to go and explore and 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 learn about how how these cities evolved and 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 look at the, some of these most spectacular kinds of um, buildings and knowledge um, and history that we have. But so I I can't really answer that in terms of what I would love most life to find. But I do think that and that what. In terms of futures, I think, I think that it, it. I think it would be much more. It's much more interesting to think about um, rather than what we leave behind. Like in terms of that, what are we like? What's the discursive shift that we're creating? Not just on a discourse, but how are we really making and imagining other possibilities so that this, the kind of systemic racism, systemic um, classism, the systemic kind of um, failure to be to, to, to of the collective that we have seen over and over and over and the kind of catastrophe we are catapulting towards at such speed, having just been through this major pandemic. How can we creatively build, use these forms to kind of imagine other other futures? And maybe those futures, the archive is not is not these is not what will be the, the the most important. I don't know if we'll even be here to find any any such thing. But that but that effort of the thinking in a planetary way of of a better form of survival. I'm much more interested in that. While I support and adore institutions that have kept and maintained archives and works because that's how we've been able to study them. So I'm not being critical of those yeah. institutions. I mean, I can be in ways, but that's not what I'm being critical of here. I just my interest is um, what, like, in creating and generating painting. It's for the visceral and co and a communicative experience now, and the transformative experience that is possible with art now, and then the and the and and then the possible way of thinking of of possible futures in the collective kind of conversations that we're having. Mm, thank you for sharing that and moving that discursive space does feel like such the project, right? Like such a gift yeah. if we could really shift conversation and leave that as a gift and and can be part of that ongoing project because other we're building on the discursive uh shifts that other people made for us right um, Absolutely. uh yeah. i'm going to end uh because uh, time has gone very quickly you had a show um and i know this is really uh you'll tell us i'll leave it um in addis uh in 2016 yeah. What was that like for you to have your first show and return? It was called your homecoming show and I looked it up. Um, tell us a little bit about that. That was an amazing experience. Yeah. And then yeah, more, yeah. Um, Doug Maweed Wolfshet um, curated that show um, along with Elizabeth Georges who runs the who runs the museum there at the university. And um, and it was it was a really moving and incredible experience to to go back to Ethiopia um, with the work. And in a way, a lot of my history with Ethiopia has been through my family mm. and has been through going back with my family and through my father and all of his family and our family that are there. And so this was really the, my first experience with Ethiopia individual not of course I'd been there many times many times with but you know there was this very independent like experience as as me myself experience having an engagement with Ethiopia as me as Julie and and with the university with students with lectures with the exhibition with um the audience and with the, the 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 welcoming of the work, the welcoming of thinking around the work, the well the excitement around that was so palpable and so moving. And w w how much the conversation has even evolved from that point. How much the the Addis Photo Fest and other projects that have been happening there by many artists on the ground there. How much that has shifted. How much the 
school, the students work has shifted. I mean, Ethiopia is really, in terms of those, in terms of that and Addis Ababa, it was really palpable to see those changes um, since that show and since before that show, how much it, how much it evolved post the dirt. So I don't know, for me, it was a really moving and transformative experience and people were so generous and kind and welcoming and that's, um, it, it, it felt, it was a profound experience. Mm, thank you for sharing that. I, yeah. I remember that being something that you wanted to happen and was really excited to see that. Um, so thank you, Julie. This has been beautiful, incredible, and uh, to to chat with you this evening, to see how your work has uh, changed and shifted and grown and evolved and deepened in so many beautiful ways over the last 20 years. Um, really seeing the show at the Whitney and being able to see all of that together, really incredible. So again, really encourage everyone to do that. And every time I've seen you speak or been engaged in conversation with you directly or seen you on one of these many Zoom chats and other uh, spaces, you always just are so incredibly um, thoughtful. And again, that was something that came across right away uh, 20 years ago. So I'm really happy to still be in conversation with you. And thank you so much. And for you being in conversation with all of us. So thank you so much uh, for joining us and, and, and chatting with me. I'm gonna turn it back now to Aisha um, to wrap us up for the evening. Thank you everyone again for joining tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Kemi. Definitely thank you, Kemi and Julie for such a insightful and powerful conversation and, and, and a perfect way. I can think of a more perfect way um, to start off our, our two day journey, uh, kind of grappling with these topics and ideas um, and things. So, so thank you so much. We've been really excited and waiting for this to happen. Um, and also uh, just a, a special thank you to our supporters as well for making programs like these possible. Also a huge thank you to the LP's team for all the thought, time and care and consideration um, that was placed into putting this program together. I uh, also wanna thank all of you over 200 attendees. I know you can't see each other and you probably can't even see the little numbers ticking up, but there are over 200 of you in, in this chat um, right now. So thank you so much for joining and listening and sharing um, all of the incredible resources, which we'll be sure to share with folks um, in our post uh, follow up after the program. Uh, I hope you'll take some of what you heard and learned back to your communities and work collectively to draw a more just future. Um, we, like I said, we'll be sharing the recording and the transcripts of the conversation shortly. And I hope that you will join. This is just a start. We have tomorrow two parts of the program. We have cartographers, we have urban planners, we have artists, we have historians uh, to dig in even deeper into this uh, conversation around what is radical mapping. If you haven't already registered to join the other two programs tomorrow um, at noon Eastern time and at 4.30 Eastern time, we've dropped the chats in the link. I hope you will attend. And we also invite you to stay up to date with what we're up to at the LP. Uh, you can see on the screen here, all of our various different handles and ways to follow us and learn more and get involved in what we do. So I hope you all have an evening. We are finishing right on time, which is amazing. It is seven o'clock uh, and yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Good night, thank you. Good night, thank you, Kemi. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Emma. <laughs>